Welcome everyone to the first Atlantic Progress Summit. I'm Derek Thompson, and it is my deep pleasure to kick things off by speaking to Stripe CEO, Patrick Collison. Patrick, welcome. Thank you for having me. So Patrick, in many ways, this entire event is your fault. In 2019, you and The Economist, Tyler Cowen, co-wrote an essay in The Atlantic entitled, We Need a New Science of Progress. And this was frankly an incredibly inspiring, clarifying, generative essay for me, and maybe for a lot of people in the room. It helped me to personally frame this constellation of issues and ideas that had really fascinated me and science and technology and politics and culture as being part of this larger question. How do people's lives improve and how can we improve people's lives faster? And in the 10 minutes that we have here, I wanna talk about two aspects of this big unwieldy idea of progress. I wanna talk about science, and I wanna talk about speed. I think one could argue that to the extent that the US has a progress problem, two ways to pin it down are to talk about the slowdown in the productivity of scientific breakthroughs and the slowdown in our ability, America's ability to build what we've invented. So let's start with science. We seem to be throwing more treasure and talent into scientific research, and yet we're getting less of a bang out of our buck. Why do you think this is? Um, today, we think about science as something that has a definite meta structure. You have these big centralized institutional funders. Science is conducted at universities with these kind of particular patterns and mechanisms. And you know, there's, there's, it's very templatized at, uh, at this point. That's actually a relatively recent invention. Uh, it uh, it basically is the is a post war creation, and the federal government didn't even become the majority funder for science in the U.S. Uh, until the '60s. And so, when you zoom out a bit and you take stock of the several century arc of science, let's say science from 1700 uh, uh, onwards, it's taken many different institutional and structural forms. Science in France in the 18th century looked very different. Uh, to uh, to science in Germany in the 19th century, to science in the U.S. in say the 1920s, as compared to uh, science today, and you know I I think over this several century period there was all sorts of cultural experimentation and you know um, mores and kind of dispositions that were better and worse adapted to certain of the problems that existed at the time. And even today, I think you know, there are certain ways in which the science that prevails is you know, super well suited to some of the problems we have and less well suited to others. So I think it's a complicated problem. You know, I don't pretend to have definitive answers, but if I had to kind of hazard a specific guess, I would say it's excessively standardized, excessively regimented, and that we're not able to benefit from some of the structural heterogeneity that we have been able to uh, benefit from in the past. It's interesting to think that the history of experiments used to be more experimental, but it's only in the last, say, 50, 60 years with the rise of the NIH, the NSF, that we've had this more bureaucratized form of science. And of course, the NSF and the NIH have done extraordinary, extraordinary things, um, but there might be ways in which they are too slow, too conservative to quickly evaluate many proposals from scientists, including more radical ones. Is is that a part of the problem? Is it is it speed in science and a, a preference for experimenting that might allow all of America's scientists to be a little bit more creative, generative? Well, it's interesting. So um, as, the, uh, as the NSF and the NIH were being established, um, there was a lot of concern on the part of scientists and university administrators themselves that an inadvertent byproduct uh, of formalizing some of this might be some of this regimentation and bureaucratization and so on that has in fact, I think, as an objective matter ensued. I mean, that's what the scientists themselves report uh, when you go and survey them. And so this is actually something that there was uh, uh, some attention paid to at the time. Part of what I find even more interesting is that early NIH administrators themselves uh, repeatedly emphasize the importance of not having this happen. You know, they, they sort of recognize that, you know, especially in the Second World War, you know, obviously science was such an enormous contributor uh, to the uh, to the Allied victory. And so I think there was a correct determination that, man, there are some enormous prospects here. And if we can sort of continue our support for science the way, the way we did during the war, that has, you know, tremendous prospects in terms of benefits for society. But, you know, we really have to make sure to, uh, to not, you know, kill some uh, some golden goose um, uh, uh, as uh, as we kind of venture uh, into this, and you know, I, 
I think it is the natural course of human institutions uh, and human sociology and so on that, um, you know, stasis would be an exaggeration, but let's say some degree of calcification uh, is extraordinarily difficult to avoid. And look, this, this is true of all organizations. I work at a company and this is a force that is tremendously difficult for companies to avoid, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, it's, it's not that I think anyone necessarily did anything wrong. It's, it's a natural force. To, the, to your direct question, as to you know the degree to which lack of speed is you know fundamentally part of the challenge, I think that's you know I I, I think that is somewhat true. That is to say that I, I think if we just um, uh, uh, insisted that you know all of the various um, actions and procedures that are part of this whole edifice had to happen somewhat faster, I think that would be almost certainly a, a meaningful improvement. But I would actually, I think, go a level deeper still and say, well, you know, why are they slow? Maybe they're slow because it's accumulated a lot of trust through time. And, you know, maybe we need more things and more radical and dramatic things a la ARPA-H and things that are perhaps even larger departures than ARPA-H that will intrinsically be faster, not just because we impose more fastness you know, rules on them, uh, but because, um, because just there, there's there's less accumulated and it's easier for them to kind of act with uh, some kind of, you know, par parsimony of action. Briefly, before we go to the speed with which we build that which we invent, invent, tell us a little bit about what Fast Grants was, what it was a response to, and maybe one really important lesson that you learned from the Fast Grants experiment. Right. So Fast Grants was a, uh, was a program that we set up. Actually, you know, it was myself, and my uh, my partner, uh, who herself is a scientist, um, and uh, my now wife, in fact, uh, not at the time, uh, and Tyler Cohen, with whom uh, with whom uh, I wrote this essay that you mentioned, and it was a program we set up in the early days of the of the COVID pandemic, uh, where we realized that there were tons of scientists that wanted to urgently repurpose their research and shift direction to to do something that was you know directly relevant to this incredibly acute crisis that we all faced but who were inhibited by a lack of funding or by rules and kind of constraints around the funding where you can't just willy-nilly go and spend it on something totally unrelated. Um, uh, you know, there, 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 are, um, there, are, there are procedures around that. And so, you know, as we anecdotally heard about instances of this, we decided to set up a program uh, and, to, and to issue small but rapid grants to these scientists. Uh, and so, you know, the typical fast grants funding amount was about 100K. These were not enormous grants, uh, and over the course of a couple of months, in you know, primarily 2020, uh, uh, Fast Grants funded about 200 labs uh, with uh, about $50 million of grants, supported by a whole bunch of different philanthropists. And it ended up being pretty high impact. So some of the uh, some of the early important work, like for example, the recognition that salivary testing works mm -hmm. basically as well as those you know incredibly intrusive uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, that, that that was an early important finding in the summer of 2020. And then there were a whole bunch of sort of therapeutic discoveries and you know other things that you know bore, 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 bore fruit uh, subsequently. Um, my learning from this was. Um, I, you know, I, I think this is actually a good example of uh, where institutional and structural experimentation and just structural variation is advantageous and desirable. I think it would be a terrible idea for fast grants to be like the singular prevailing mechanism for funding science. Like there were tons of things that are like, you know, fast grants could never fund CERN. Fast grants could you know, never fund uh, a really large clinical trial. There, there were lots of things that fast grants would be very maladapted for. But for certain kinds of acute urgent research, fast grants was really well suited. And so kind of my takeaway from this was, well, you know, this is a suggestive proof point uh, that more points in the possibility space would be advantageous and desirable. And kind of the question that leaves me with is, if fast grants is one model, what are the other nine? Great. So to tie a bow around the science part of this, you know, we built these in incredible behemoths of scientific funding in the middle of the 20th century that today are even more behemoth-like than they were in the 20th century. And it might be worthwhile to experiment around that sort of that entree of NSF and NIH with a bunch of appetizers yes. of many, many different fast grants. You could, you could wrap I it up. Absolutely that. And I would just say that to do so would be a continuation um, uh, of the pioneering spirit uh, of America.
American science uh, in that in the late 19th century, there were very few places in the US where top tier science was being done at all. And it was a bunch of deliberate reformers uh, at places like Johns Hopkins, um, uh, some of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the turn of the century presidents at Harvard, you know, these stories of uh, James Conant, uh, uh, who became president of Harvard, going to Germany uh, in the early 20th century and realizing how like, he was depressed and how much more sophisticated they were than the US. And so we kind of take for granted that the US has always been at the vanguard, the frontier, preeminent, et cetera. That's not the case. A couple of people decided, no, we should change and vary how we do things. It's possible for us to make you know, a, a meaningful progress. They did. Uh, and, uh, and so I think a continuation of that mindset uh, would, be, uh, would be very advantageous and, uh, and beneficial. Our mutual friend, Eli Dorado has a nice turn of phrase. He says, it's not, just that new ideas are getting harder to find. Rather, the bigger problem is that new ideas are getting harder to use. Uh, we knew, for example, how to dig holes and put steel in the ground 100, 150 years ago. In 1900, we built the first 28 subway stations in New York City in four years. And if you ask someone on that day in 1904, when the subway opened in New York City, how fast they thought we'd be able to build, uh, say, a Second Avenue subway in 110 years, that person would have said, oh my God, we'll do it in like 17 days. Well, it took 17 years. And that is just a microcosm of the fact that in the United States, it has become harder to build a range of things, infrastructure, houses, transmission lines, clean energy. When do you think this slowdown in America's ability to build really took root? Well, I think at this summit, the obvious answer is 1971. Um, uh, and uh, I presume a large fraction of the attendees uh, are familiar with the website, WTF happened in 1971.com. And if you're not, you should head there it's extremely suggestive. Uh, I don't know that it was 1971 per se, um, but most of the relevant time series do seem to you know, change in slope uh, around then. And, um, and well, let, uh, let me follow up know, quickly. It's, it's, let's, uh, let's assume it was in the 1970s. WTF do you think is the most important thing that happened in the 1970s that might have led to this slowdown in our capacity to build what we know? Yeah, you know, there, there are there, there are lots of I think um, legitimate hypotheses. I mean, well, clearly some of it was you know the oil shock and some of the economic changes and so on. And I think you know that 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 has some validity. Um, but clearly there were also definitive, you know, specific structural things that happened. You know, like for example the creation of the EPA and uh, and you know things analogous to the EPA in different places and organizations in California and so on. Um, and you know, I think this maybe highlights some of the uh, some of the tension here, where presumably we don't want a world with you know no EPA or with you know uh, our our waterways and uh, and our oceans and our air having you know the the the, the famous smog that you know LA suffered from uh, in the uh, in the seventies and eighties. So anyway, I, I think there were kind of some specific uh, uh, kind of mechanistic and institutional changes like that uh, around then that I think are somewhat causally responsible. However. You know, I I, um, I just got back from I was in Germany and uh, and Poland uh, over uh, over the Thanksgiving break, and I was thinking a lot about you know Germany in the in the nineteenth century, and you know it of course is the place. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a preposterously long list. Let's say the seventeenth and eighteenth century, the the Aufklärung, their enlightenment. And, you know, you've von Humboldt and Beethoven and Haydn and basically the invention of classical music de facto and Gauss and Euler um, and Goethe and Halle and Göttingen and just like on and on and on and on. And like we could, most people here could you know fairly readily name twenty phenomenal uh, you know Austro Germans uh, Prussians you know whatever from this period. I think we'd all struggle to enumerate that list, uh, you know, post 1950 or so, um, you know, over the last 70 years from kind of that that, that same region. And you know, Germany, of course, has you know major challenges in the 20th century. But the point I'm trying to get at is, for 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 reasons that the culture really changed, um, uh, and you know, it, it did not just uh, uh, affect Germany in the domain of geopolitics uh, or, you know, things directly related to, 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 to the wars, it affected Germany in places like music. Uh, it affected Germany in places like mathematics, right? Um, and, you know, part of that was emigration and, and, and the tragedies of the Holocaust and all the rest. Shifting it back to the U.S., I, I guess, you know, I'm now at um, uh, 
how is it that our culture changed over the course of the 20th century? What undergirded that? Uh, and, and, and how should we think about it? And, you know, in, 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 in which ways, you know, is that desirable? Which, which ways do we want to protect that? And, you know, uh, uh, what is it that we could do to change our cultural orientation such that, to your point, um, uh, subways can be uh, closer to 17 days uh, rather than uh, 17 years? I'm glad you ended on culture because one thing that I want to do with this event is to put forward the thesis that progress is a stool with four legs. It's science, which is how we learn about the world. It's technology, which is how we turn those understandings of the universe and our bodies into products that become hopefully cheap and safe and available. It's politics and policy, which determines the playing field on which these technology companies uh, operate. And finally, it's culture, because you need demand for new ideas in order for them to flourish. And I think there's lots of uh, panels here that, that speak to all of this, the science, the tech, the politics, and the culture. So Patrick Collison, thank you very, very much for getting us started. I really appreciate it. Derek, thank you so much for hosting this event. Um, uh, super excited about it and can't wait for your book. <laughs> thank you very much.